this week on the Back Table Podcast. My grand scheme in life that I came up with really is to make musculoskeletal ultrasound as ubiquitous as MRI and as available and as quality. You know, for, for radiologists, the biggest challenge is going to be getting out of the reading room. I think for IR docs, it's going to be a little bit easier. And, and I'll tell you why. You know, if you're a radiologist and the only procedures you're doing are fluoro, like, you know, esophagrams and things like that, or CT guided stuff in a hospital, you don't get a lot of opportunities to hold the probe. You've got to get your hand on that probe. You've got to get that probe onto a patient. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your home for all things interventional and otherwise minimally invasive. You can find all previous episodes of our podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all other major podcast platforms. Feel free to reach out to us on social media with suggestions about how we can improve the podcast and bring more valuable resources to the interventional community. Now, a quick word from our sponsor. Taking out med school loans had me watching every penny. I took two buses to get to campus. During my residency, I walked 20 blocks. But since I opened a Laurel Road Link checking account when I refinanced my loans, I got a crazy low rate plus a cash bonus. And all that extra money helped me finally buy my own car. Where are we going? Anywhere we want. Laurel Road for doctors. Banking insights and benefits uniquely designed for doctors. See laurelroad.com slash doctor checking for full terms and conditions. Laurel Road is a brand of KeyBank NA member FDIC. Now back to the show. This is your host, Jacob Fleming. And today I'm excited to welcome to the show, Dr. Jason Cox musculoskeletal radiologist and founder of the Ultrasound First Clinic in the greater St. Louis area. Dr. Cox, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here today. Excited to do the show. Yeah, we're really excited to have you and talk about a little bit of a different topic. You know, most of our audience is in the more vascular and interventional area, but as radiologists, I think we all have an interest in using the technologies that we have to expand the capabilities of what we have to offer to patients and really excited to hear about your experience with that today. But before we dive into that, I'd just like to hear a little bit about your background. You know, tell us a little bit about you, how you got into medicine, radiology, and then, and then ultimately your developing niche in this area. So I grew up in St. Louis, uh, come from a working class family. I was actually the first person to even graduate high school from my family. And then first person to go to college and that kind of stuff. So, you know, growing up, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I thought I was going to be like a auto mechanic or work in a, in a factory like my dad did. And then I got into sports and really got into, you know, orthopedic type stuff and, you know, working out and then had planned on going to college to play football. But then I also kind of wanted to go to go to the army. So my master plan was to go into the army and do something that was incredibly physically challenging and then get out and go play football in college. So I went to the recruiter and told him this plan. And he said, oh, the infantry is what you want to do. That's, that's the most physically challenging thing that you can do there. So that's how I ended up in the infantry. And that was back in, you know, 96 to 2002. So I absolutely loved it. You know, I went straight out of high, out of high school. I loved every second of it. And then at that point I thought maybe I'd get out and, you know, go play football and be an engineer or something technical like that. But then while I was in, I got injured on a training mission, you know, nothing scary or anything. I just dislocated my shoulder <laughs> and, uh, you know, I ended up getting a bank cart repair, which, you know, everybody here knows what that is. And, you know, my orthopedic surgeon that I had that was in the army, he was like, Hey, you're kind of a smart guy. Why don't you look into medicine and, and think about that? And so he kind of became my mentor. His name was Doug Vermillion. Um, I believe he's retired now, but he, he actually got out and moved up to Alaska, but he really encouraged me. And, you know, I got a lot of advice from him along the way. And when I got out, I ended up coming back to St. Louis, went to St. Louis university for undergrad and then went to Mizzou for, uh, medicine thinking I was going to do like sports medicine. Cause you know, again, I really liked all this stuff. I ended up not playing football because <laughs> of my, because of my shoulder injury, but you know, all of these things, you know, it's got a common theme, you know, musculoskeletal this, musculoskeletal that, you know, I'm doing all this stuff physical. And then, so I end up in, in medical school. I find out that sports medicine, you know, like family medicine track wasn't for me at all. And so then I really got hooked on radiology, probably my first year. I mean, like I just, they brought out the x-rays and I was like, wow, this is amazing. You know? So then I started hanging around the, uh, radiology department, ended up, you know, staying at Mizzou for radiology residency. 
And then I thought I was going to do interventional. Um, and I was fortunate because the Mizzou program didn't have a fellowship, but they had, you know, a full service trauma, level one trauma center, bariatric center, all these things that, you know, need interventional radiology. And, you know, the radiology department ran its own vascular lab, which I know a lot of places don't, you know, vascular surgery has it. So then, you know, I did about nine months of IR training through electives and just regular rotations in my residency. And then probably close to my R4 year, Julia Krem, a lot of people may have heard of her, but she was out of Utah. You know, she's written a lot for um, a lot of different books, like, you know, with Jeff Ross and BJ Manister, and she's pretty well known. She came to the program and then I through, you know, my wife's input a little bit, decided to do MSK instead of IR, probably in my R4 year. And then, so I was really fortunate in that regard to kind of fall into all of these things. You know, it's kind of been the theme of my life is just, you know, you fall into these opportunities, you take them and you run with them. And if Julie Krim wouldn't have been there, maybe I would have been in VIR right now. So I don't know. Sure. It's, it's crazy to think about how things could have gone differently just based on almost happenstance. But I, I love your story. Uh, just numerous instances of kind of thinking you're going in one direction and then recognizing, okay, actually going this way is a bit more appealing to my interests. And I, I can obviously relate to pivoting from uh, vascular to MSK. And I think that for a lot of uh, interventional radiologists, I've noticed a, a lot of them like MSK as well, because, because of that mechanical sort of engineering aspect to it. Was that something that always kind of drew you to that as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm a very hands-on person um, as far as technical, you know, I, I've always loved all of it. I love math. I love building things. I love, you know, anything that I can do with my hands. And I see that, you know, in all of my colleagues, you know, they all have that ability and that kind of spatial awareness that draws them into doing procedures. And, and so, yeah, I think that's going to be a common theme amongst everyone. Absolutely. And that, that sense of integration of visual spatial and hand-eye coordination, uh, that is obviously germane to uh, vascular and interventional radiology. It's not lost with the musculoskeletal interventions, obviously, but also the ultrasound evaluation, which is what we really want to hammer into today. Musculoskeletal ultrasound is a really interesting area because uh, there are a lot of different specialties getting involved with it. And it's also an area where it seems to me that diagnostic radiology is a specialty as a whole exactly where it's going with regards to musculoskeletal ultrasound is right now a little bit unclear. And so I'd really like to hear about what experiences you had that attracted you to it and, and how did you go about getting that training? Was it during your fellowship uh, or residency or did you have to pursue some different opportunities to start building that expertise? Yeah. So again, just an opportunity, you know, Julia Krem came kind of rebuilt the MSK program there at University of Missouri. At the same time, they were building this massive orthopedic center, the uh, Missouri Orthopedic Institute. And during this process, we ended up with a new uh, MSK intervention room with new ultrasound with, you know, C-arm and fluoro and all this other stuff. And, you know, up until that point, maybe I had done a couple ultrasounds in my entire residency you know, for MSK, we had a full vascular service, you know, we'd do 70 to a hundred ultrasounds a day there for just that. So we had really good training there for vascular, which also lends to MSK, like you were saying. And so then during fellowship, that's really when, you know, it came in. So our rotation was basically, you know, you'd have diagnostic MRI, and then you also covered ultrasound on the MRI day. And then that alternated with CT plane film and then procedures. So it depended on which procedure it was, you know, it would either go to the ultrasound person for the ultrasound guided procedure, or it would go to the CT person for if it was a spine or, you know, some other MSK interventions. So obviously there's a division one football team, a bunch of division one sports there. So, you know, we got to see all the athletes and then on top of that, run of the mill every day, normal people would come in and, you know, we'd do rotator cuffs, ultrasound guided steroid injections. 10X type tenotomies, you know, that was kind of the, the mainstay of things. And I, I went through back in 2000, I think 14 to 15. Yeah. And 
um, just the whole program, it was just in a huge building phase. And so we really built up from doing no kind of MSK ultrasound to, you know, maybe 20 a day. And that's including interventions. Whereas most people, when they get their experience with MSK ultrasound, it's from the intervention side, you know, they're doing, you know, injections either as an order service or they're maybe they're running a pain clinic or something like that. And so that's, that's really where it started. So I did have formal training in an MSK program. On top of that, you know, we, again, we didn't have an IR fellowship. So if anytime there was like a, you know, MSK vascular malformation or, you know, something like that, I would just walk over to the hospital and do the case with my IR attending over there. So for like a direct puncture or, you know, a sclerosis or something like that. So that was really the spear of it. Then when I got out and went into practice, I went straight to private practice. I went into a big group that had about 80 radiologists. We covered about 40 hospitals and clinics. And, you know, I had a full IR set of skills from, you know, residency plus my pain and intervention, spine interventions skill set. And so I went straight into that and was kind of the group's interventional guy. I ran a pain clinic there at my main hospital and then did about 50% pain and intervention, you know, with biopsies, nef tubes, IBC filters, pick lines, you know, that kind of stuff, nothing arterial, but then also had to travel around the whole, you know, 40 places and do all these special cases. And then a lot of times, you know, I'd have to drive like three hours to go do an MSK ultrasound. Wow. You know, just a diagnostic. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so then I was like, you know what, maybe there's a better way to do this. Yeah. And um, <laughs> so then I started kind of getting this idea in my head about diagnostics and how you would put them into practice in a, in a radiology system that's more efficient. You know, it, it would cost a radiology group money. Really, if you pulled an MSK radiologist off of reading MRI to have them do a diagnostic ultrasound, because there are no trained sonographers around here. There are none. I'll, I'll get to that later. So then I, I actually left that group and went to another employed position where I was supposed to build up kind of a ultrasound and intervention practice there. And, you know, it was at an outpatient imaging center system. And so I thought that was going to be the way to do it. And, uh, they were so busy with everything that, you know, we could do the ultrasounds, but you know, my schedule was, you know, maybe I could do two to four a day. And then, you know, I would have to travel between five different imaging centers and have patients scheduled. And so my schedule was getting out like two to four weeks before they could get these. And then that kind of defeats the purpose. So then, you know, I started getting patients that would like drive two, three, four hours to come to my clinic to get an ultrasound for like a rotator cuff or a median nerve or you know, a vascular malformation, that kind of stuff. And then one day I got some guy flew in from California to get this rotator cuff ultrasound. Wow. And I was like, why, why are you here? You know? <laughs> <laughs> There's gotta be a better way. <laughs> the guy said the insurance company, the MRI was going to be $2,000 out in California. You know how their healthcare system is out there. And they said, you have to get this ultrasound first before we pay for the MRI. And that's where ultrasound first was born. That's, uh, I, that's, that's really interesting. The arc of how you, you had a really excellent experience in fellowship, getting so much experience with musculoskeletal ultrasound, and you came out into practice with these skill sets ready to go. And just the logistics of everything are kind of preventing getting these services to the patients. It's so interesting. And so with that, tell us about the ultrasound first clinic. You gave us the seeds of the idea. How did that come to fruition to initially being open? When, when did you open? And just, just tell us about the clinic. So kind of COVID prompted me into it a bit. I think a lot of people have that similar story because when COVID hit as an outpatient imaging center, we basically, everything we did was optional, not a mandatory or urgent service. So then, you know, we were actually shut down from doing much. Like at one point we were doing nothing. I mean, just five radiologists sitting there in five imaging centers, absolutely doing nothing, not actually getting paid. Our contract was you get paid for what you, what you read. So we're just all sitting around and I'm like, you know what, I think I'm going to start looking into, you know, how can I do my own thing so that I'm never in this position again, where I'm just sitting here on somebody else's control telling me I can't make money. Right. It's kind of a catch 22 to be in that sort of situation. Yeah. And so all the routine services were shut down and I, I just started kind of investigating, you know, how much ultrasounds get paid for, how much the professional versus technical versus, you know, the, the global fee and all that. And then I just kind of put together the business model 
and put it on paper. And I was like, yeah, this could work. And so then I, I put all that together and then I partnered up with a buddy of mine. Uh, he did the fellowship the year before I did. His name's Kevin Ingalls. And um, he's more on the business side of the partnership right now. But later on, once this is established, we've thought if this works, you know, it was like an experiment. You know, if this model works, then we'll start opening these things up. And so then, you know, I put the business together. I rented an office and opened up in February of last year. And I just basically worked there when I was on vacation. I just saw patients when I had vacation days and I just didn't take a single day of vacation for myself all last year. Just worked at the clinic and kind of proved the proof of concept, went through some things, did some pivots. Um, one huge challenge is having a sonographer that can do cases for you versus doing them yourself. You know, I can do every single ultrasound of the body, any one of them. You know, I have that capability with the exception of echo. I'm not going to claim I can do echo. I have no training on that. But yeah, like I, I even brought in a sonographer who was MSK trained and had challenges with that. It's different doing cases as a sonographer versus as a radiologist. And so I had to kind of figure out how to train even somebody who's MSK trained to do the kind of cases that we're doing here. Because we don't do just, you know, rotator cuffs. It's mostly high level stuff. You know, I see professional sports players, post-op cases, you know, all this stuff that's coming in here. And then, you know, you just can't have a sonographer just do those high-end cases. So I did that part-time until November. And, you know, I had decided at that point, probably back in, you know, mid-year that I was going to leave my other position and it required a six months notice. So six months before November, I decided I was leaving. And then I started full-time in November. And, you know, we've had double growth every month since, wow. since I came full-time. That's fantastic. And I would like to talk a little bit more about the difficulties with training up a sonographer to be helping with the clinic. One thing, if you could give us an idea of the mix of diagnostic and the interventional cases, I understand you're still doing some interventional cases from injections to more complicated things like ultrasound guided carpal tunnel release. Can you tell us a little bit about that mixture? Yeah. So right now I kind of look at the numbers before we, we looked at this, I'm at like 58% intervention and obviously the rest diagnostics. And then kind of a lot of that too, is whenever a patient comes in, I get a lot of orders from doctors that say, if this, then inject, which is actually a problem with the business model because you can only get paid for one, right? So say this person comes in for a rotator cuff injury or shoulder injury, or even post-op or adhesive capsulitis. They want you to diagnose it. You either do it or your sonographer does it. And then you do the injection and then you can only get paid for one of those, especially by Medicare. Medicare is very bad about paying for anything. Some of them will, you know, they'll say, hey, you did this. So there's a lot of stuff you have to dictate and try to make your case that this should be paid as a diagnostic and an injection. And then typically they'll discount one of them, the more expensive one to pay for it both. But with having said that, you know, those were just kind of like the challenges of figuring out the clinic because we're kind of like a doctor's office pain clinic slash, you know, interventional service and diagnostic service. Our schedule is, is just like an outpatient imaging center. So, you know, patients can schedule themselves. We can schedule patients for them. Doctors offices can schedule. We can schedule for the doctor's office. We have all that capability. And then, so all of the diagnostics, you know, they just get filled in as they do. And then, you know, I mark which cases in the system I have to do versus the sonographer can do. So obviously all the procedures I'm going to do. And those were more hands-on with the procedures, you know, like we want to vet these out a little bit more. And then a lot of times when people show up, they don't even know what procedure they're getting. And even the doctor, you know, they, they just send them here for me to evaluate them directly. And then I decide what to do. So in my interventional practice, since we're just talking about this, we'll just talk about the interventions that I do first. The biggest thing I do here is uh, ultrasound guided carpal tunnel release. There's a device that I use, you know, there's a couple different devices. I don't even know the names of the other ones, but I use the Sonex Ultra Glide CTR. And if you have ever done a breast biopsy, and if you have ever done an angioplasty, it's basically those two tools put together, right? So it's got balloons on the tip. I think it's a 10 gauge needle that has a knife or micro knife that kind of recesses in there, you know, ultrasound guided, you know, you make like usually pretty small incision, you know, it's probably maybe a three millimeters incision, maybe four. Slide that into the carpal tunnel after you've done local anesthesia in your office and then release the ligament with the knife, the ultra glide. And it's done. You know, it takes me about, you know, it depends on what kind of variant anatomy is in there, but most of the time it can be done in 10 minutes. So I, I think it's an amazing first thing for any 
interventional radiologist to pick up. If they want to integrate or if they want to start doing MSK in their practice, because I know a lot of IR docs are, you know, having their own clinics and seeing patients directly. And I think that's like really the first step to integrating that kind of MSK service into your practice is to pick up a procedure like that because it's in your wheelhouse for doing procedures and you have to, you're forced to, you know, become more aware of anatomy. You know, you're used to looking at, you know, the radial artery or the ulnar artery, or, you know, you know, to avoid certain things, but once you start looking deeper, you're going to find out all the anatomy of the smaller nerves, you know, the recurrent motor branch, cutaneous branch, the different, you know, digital branches, you all of a sudden, you know, you've been looking at them all this, this entire time. And now all of a sudden they're there and you know about them and you get to use your skill set. And that procedure is pretty amazing because, you know, the patients recover within like three to six days. They didn't have to have anesthesia. They don't have a big incision on their hand to recover from. I mean, it's the essence of what interventional radiology is about. A procedure that's not going to require them to have six weeks of healing. That, that's the biggest thing I do in here. I don't do any conscious sedation here. I don't do any of that stuff. So all, all under local anesthesia. Yeah, everything's under local regional block or anesthesia. You know, I would do bone biopsies in here, muscle biopsies. I do thyroid biopsies, uh, many kind of masses, just nothing intraperitoneal or, you know, I won't go into the thorax, obviously more superficial stuff. And then I, I have a, a big perineural injection clinic, Morton Roma injections. I would say a lot of podiatry and post-op type injections where, you know, say a patient has had a, a pulley repair or something and they've got denosing tenosynovitis you know, the, the hand surgeon will send them to me to do an ultrasound guided injection to help that. There's a lot of different injections, a lot of different tendon barbitage. Are, are you aware of those? Do you guys do a lot of those? I'd be curious. Uh, you know, in my program, we do uh, just a few, but it's, it's a really cool procedure. Yeah. Would you mind telling the audience a bit about that? Yeah. So I'll have to send you this picture, but I just did the worst one I've ever seen in my life on Friday night. You know, I was there doing it for an hour and a half. It, it wow. Was, it was pretty <laughs> egregious, <laughs> but it was amazing, amazing result. But so anyway, what you do is you just, most often it's going to be in the shoulder and the rotator cuff. Sometimes it'll be in the gluteal tendons and it's hydroxyapatite deposition disease. Most often, uh, sometimes it'll be CPPD or maybe even gout, but that's very rare. So most often it's going to be in the, the supraspinatus tendon, subscap, then infra, probably the least common in my experience. So, you know, you've got these, uh, crystal deposition deposits with calcium in the, in the rotator cuff tendon, the patient, you, you instantly know when they walk in, what's wrong with them. You don't have to do any kind of diagnosis because they can't move. I mean, it's one of the worst experiences of a patient's life. They've told me people who have had kidney stones, childbirth, and this say that the order is kidney stones, this, and then childbirth. Um, so it's extremely painful for the patient. And most of the time doctors just want to treat them with like naproxen or something like that. Well, we as interventionalists can step in there and solve their problem immediately. So what I do is I just do, a, you know, do a pretty procedure ultrasound, kind of map out where I'm going to go. These deposits are usually just a few centimeters deep to the skin surface in the tendon. I then use a 25 gauge hypodermic needle, get into the subacromal subdeltoid bursa, fill that up with about three to five mils of 1% lidocaine. Then I back that 25 gauge needle out and then go into the deposit and just kind of uh, fenestrate it with multiple passes. And then I will attempt to do a lavage. So the lavage is you just kind of pulse, you know, you have a, a syringe that's filled with 1% uh, lidocaine and normal saline. Um, I usually put about, you know, five to seven mils into a 10 mil syringe. And then you just kind of pulse and you watch on the ultrasound in real time. And then you can watch kind of the fluid tracking into it. And it just kind of eats away at the calcium, depending on the stage that it's in until there's kind of like a dam that breaks. So satisfying. The dam just kind of breaks. And then, you know, you see this, this big whoosh of particles and, and fluid inside the calcium. And then you actually see it come back into the syringe, which is so satisfying to see that white blush just coming back into the syringe. And then sometimes you, you know, depending on how big it is, you can treat it with a 25 gauge needle, but most often those needles are in a clog and then you'll have to change out to an 18. And the 18 really gets the job done. The patients are most of the time, they don't have a whole lot of pain. They have pressure and it kind of depends on in the stage of the bursitis that they're in. Cause usually they have a rip roar and bursitis, but yeah, you will start getting back through the 18, like a mix of aqueous calcium and then actual visible chunks of calcium that are just falling out of the fluid into your syringe. And you know, you do that. It's all, it's pretty variable, but, uh, you know, most of the time my cases will last about 10 minutes per calcification, just of needle time. 
inside there. And then that one was the longest one I ever did. She had massive calcifications in her infra and in her supra and was just in excruciating pain. And then the calcifications were more all the way to the myotendinous junction. So anytime she internally rotated, it pulled those calcifications into the acromia. So it was just extremely bad for her. But for some reason, I probably do a couple of those a month, three to four. Um, I've kind of become the guy that does them. And um, it's not like a huge moneymaker or anything, but it does really get your name out there because a lot of orthopedic surgeons don't even know about it. Sure. Yeah. And and like you said, there's a huge need for these patients. As radiologists, we've probably all read dozens or hundreds of radiographs and we say, oh, there's some calcific tendonitis tendinosis or whatever and move on with our lives. But I think it's really exciting to realize that not only is something that's uh, relatively prevalent, not only is it treatable, but the technique you just described is just basic equipment, needles, syringe, lidocaine, saline, and ultrasound. Yeah. And just going at it with the skill sets that we have as radiologists. It's awesome. And I would really like to hear about both that and then the carpal tunnel release. How did you go about building up referrals and what's kind of your, your current referral base like for both of those? Kind of when I first started the clinic, you know, I had already built up a little bit of a reputation as the ultrasound guy over in Illinois because in, in St. Louis, you know, it's just right across the river. You know, you have kind of a metropolitan area over there that's included in the service area of St. Louis. So, you know, St. Louis is the big referral area. And then over there are some, you know, secondary or, you know, rural hospitals even that all refer back to here. And so a lot of my patients that were coming over there for pain, you know, I had a little bit of a... um a referral basis interchange between, you know, the major hospitals here and over there. So I had a little bit of that. And then I had built up a reputation for ultrasound on that side of the river, but nobody knew me over here. And then, so when I was in the imaging center, then I started to kind of build up my reputation there while I was employed. And then when I moved into my, my regular practice, I had a little bit of a following by that. So I, I have to give that a little bit of credit. Then on top of that, Starting a practice, you know, any kind of private practice or imaging clinic, it takes a lot of marketing and, you know, just the old school stuff. Anytime I read like a diagnostic case, because I do read some diagnostics, you know, as a, as a Telerade red contract, basically, you know, anytime I saw something like that, I, I would say, hey, there's calcific tendonitis. This person needs a tendon barbitage using ultrasound guidance, <laughs> you know? So, and I wouldn't do it inappropriately, obviously, you know, our job is to recommend the next step in management. You know, and that is it. And then the person who ordered the test calls me up and says, Hey, where do I get this done? Well, I happen to do those here. If you want to, you know, you can send your patient here. And so that was part of it. And then just going around and meeting doctors and going to, um, different things. Um, it, it helps to have kids that are in athletics because they have to go to the doctor when they're injured. And then, you know, I show up in their office. I'm like, Hey, yeah, you ain't go here's my card. You know, this is the kind of stuff I do. And then one thing just leads to another, you know, I do a lot of stuff on LinkedIn too. LinkedIn actually helps. And I would encourage all radiologists to get on there. For some reason, there's not a lot of doctors on LinkedIn and there, and there really needs to be more. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, yeah, I really enjoy a lot of the stuff you share there. And uh, I think the, one of the great things about it is there's just kind of naturally a lot of cross specialty and cross discipline stuff. And so I, I see a lot of interaction between not just physicians of different specialties, but physical therapists and all kinds of different healthcare disciplines. And then of course, reps and things like that. It's a little bit more of an expansive network, I think by its nature than, than Twitter, which I, I obviously love Twitter for, for different reasons. We have a great radiology, IR kind of community on there where we share and nerd out about cases. But I agree, LinkedIn, it has a lot of potential for spreading awareness of these more kind of niche offerings. Right. And then you know, you just, even doctors in the MSK space, number one, it does help that I'm kind of the guy in town that does these. Obviously I'm here with Mallinckrodt and Mallinckrodt's huge in it, you know, it kind of grew up there, but even them, they have a busy schedule and you just can't get in to go over there and get your stuff done. So I'm the only private doctor in town that does these mainly. And, you know, a lot of the relationships are built with cases that can't get MRI, you know? So if you're, if you're an interventional radiologist and you're seeing patients and you integrated this into your practice, you know, you just had it in there, you know, they send you somebody who can't get a rotator cuff on MRI because they have a, a cochlear implant or something. And, you know, then that, that doctor remembers you, you know, they're like, Hey, maybe, maybe I can call this doctor and get some advice or maybe, maybe ultrasound's good for this kind of stuff. 
on other patients. And I, you know, it's not like I'm marketing in my reports, but I don't just put in a simple report. My reports look like an MRI report. So that's, that's one thing I would encourage everybody to do is to really treat ultrasound as it deserves to be treated and say the stuff that you can say, because, you know, the reason people come to me is because he went to another hospital and, and I'm, I'm not saying there's any offense to any radiologist here because that's what their, their level of training is. The hospital obviously is not going to turn away any cases unless you're actually in charge of your department at this point. But, you know, they, they show up and, you know, next thing you know, on the list, there's a MSK ultrasound of the elbow. And all you have is kind of a cine clip of the elbow from the sonographer who doesn't know what they're doing. And then the radiologist is like, I can't trust this. You know, <laughs> even if I know what I'm looking at, you know, you can't do that. Yeah. So, no, no fluid collection visualized. Right. No fluid collection, no mass. Get MRI. <laughs> That's the yeah, standard yeah. report for most MSK. Right. right? Mm -hmm. So mine don't do that. Mine read just like an MRI. You know, I'm going to give a measurement of a tear, a thickness of a tear, how far it is from the, you know, retraction. I will give differential diagnosis. And then, you know, everything is in there. I mean, it's, it's looks just like an MRI report, you know, so, so far as it can go. And, uh, I don't hedge either. If it's a rotator cuff tear, I'm going to say, this is what it is. And I'm not going to say you need to get an MRI. You know, I probably recommend MRI for a couple things. You know, if there's something that's bone that looks weird, I'll say, get a plain film. And then, you know, maybe you need to get an MRI too, you know, cause I've, I've definitely diagnosed several bone cancers, several, wow. you know, I see fractures all the time that weren't suspected on ultrasound, you know, stuff that you wouldn't think shows up. Yeah. I, th I think a lot of people would be surprised by how much you can see on the ultrasound. And if you think about it, it makes sense. I mean, even reading MRI, say of the hand or something, we may see a tiny kind of couple millimeter lesion or something like that. And it's kind of like, well, I don't know, you know, we sort of give the signal characteristics, what it is not really sure. If you look at that same thing on ultrasound and specifically using the specific probes for MSK, which I, I'd like to hear you talk about as well. It's so, so much greater for looking at the superficial soft tissue. So in terms of modality, ultrasound, I imagine is for a lot of things, probably the best for the amount of detail you can get for superficial abnormalities. Absolutely. And I'm not the guy that's out here saying replace MRI with ultrasound. I'm saying that, you know, John Jacobson put out a paper, uh, I think back in 2006, and they had just done a um, kind of a review of charges from Medicare and looked at what diagnoses were made on MRI. You know, they looked at all the, all the MRIs that were done that year for different diagnoses and found that, you know, a large percentage of them, you know, over 50% could have been diagnosed with ultrasound and, instead of MRI and could have saved United States taxpayers about, you know, $9 billion. So wow. <laughs> it, <laughs> that's pretty staggering. Yeah. So that's, that's the kind of stuff that's, that's out there that is just as ignored. But so I'll give you a case example here. So I saw a collegiate pitcher. He had had uh, ulnar collateral ligament repair. He had an internal strut and uh, native ligament repair and graft. And then he had a ulnar nerve transposition and he was continuing to have burning pain into his antibrachial fossa and forearm. The MRI was negative. The graft was intact. Everything looked fine. You know, the ulnar nerve, you know, had a little bit of changes just from the, the transposition, obviously. So then the sports doc who did the surgery sent him to me and I did the ultrasound, evaluated everything. I get to talk to the guy too, you know, so that, that helps a lot that, you know, obviously as the radiologist, typically it says pain, you don't get the history that you want. So then I'm, you know, I go through and I do, you know, on my elbow exam, I'm for pictures, especially this was a picture. I always look at like the pronator, the collateral ligament, the, uh, median nerve, ulnar nerve and radial nerve. And then, you know, I'm going up above where the transposition is and I find this little mass. It's probably about five by 10 millimeters, but it wasn't on the MRI. You couldn't see it on the MRI because it was in scar tissue and it happened to be a neuroma of the anterior cutaneous nerve. And so this dude, you know, he's about to get a new elbow reconstruction <laughs> and I find this little neuroma that's not even there. And that was surgically proven, by the way. You know, I, I told the doc, wow. I said, Hey, it's, it's, this is a cutaneous branch neuroma. Have you ever even seen a cutaneous branch on an MRI? I mean, you no, no it's way there. I can tell you, you there, definitely yeah. not. <laughs> yeah. But you know, this thing, he took it out and the guy's a hundred percent better now. So that's, that's kind of the power of it. That's amazing. Anytime I can get like a, uh, MRI plus the ultrasound of the same patient. I love posting that kind of stuff because it's just amazing. The difference. Yeah. And, and that cross modality kind of integration, it, it's just something we excel at as radiologists from day one in our training. We have to 
know how to integrate the different modalities together. And it is, I think, really gratifying when you can basically prove something on one modality that maybe was sort of suggested on, on one or the other. But as you described, sometimes the sensitivity and specificity of the ultrasound is, is so much better than even the MRI. That's really impressive. And so if not for that athlete being able to get the ultrasound, like you said, it may have been much more major surgery because they couldn't identify exactly the pain generator. Pretty amazing. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of cases like that. And those are the kind of cases that the radiologist really has to kind of step in there. And so you were kind of talking about just to kind of segue a little bit into training techs and, you know, cause a lot of radiologists are pretty shy about doing the ultrasounds or, you know, busy. It's either it's a combination of shy or busy. I don't know, but yeah, you, know, you kind of have to get in a mindset that I need to go in that room if I need to. And what I'm doing on this diagnostic screen can wait if it can. So, you know, I have a sonographer that I brought on. She was not MSK trained. Her name is Julie. Amazing, amazing employee, uh, amazing person. She just does such a good job and she's such a hard learner. You know, like, and when I mean hard learner, like she goes home and reads stuff. Like she's hard on herself. And so over the course of six months, I trained her and she got MSK certified this past month. And if, if you guys look at the stats and you're thinking about, oh, maybe I can integrate this in without doing it myself. It's going to be tough because you need to find sonographers that are hard workers. I would say the best kind of sonographer to get would be a vascular certified sonographer already, which you guys are working with and find that person that's got that motivation to just pick up that extra skill set and then make them get the certification. I don't think that the certification guarantees that you're good enough to do it, but it definitely makes you do the work. And then as far as that certification goes, I wouldn't recommend any radiologist get it. Okay. And this is the, is this the RMSK? RMSK. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not against it. Go ahead and get it. But until only, you know, 60% of people are passing that, I'm not going to take it because it's, it's just too easy and it's not proving anything. And to me, and maybe you have an opinion on this too, because, you know, a lot of people might ask you, should I get RVT or because a lot of hospitals will even require it for IR docs, or, you know, if you're going to be reading stuff, well, I, I don't encourage it because what I don't want to happen is for hospitals to see that designation and then think that that means that people can do it and then require radiologists to get it. Sure. Yeah. As a requirement rather than sort of a, a proof of specific just expertise that you've acquired. And the way, the way I see it, my opinion based on my limited knowledge of this is it seems fairly similar to the RPVI, Registered Physician and Vascular Interpretation, which is obviously something that is pursued by other specialties similar to this. And so by our background as radiologists, you know, we're, it's understood that we, we have the capability and the expertise in this. And uh, right now the RS, RMSK is a little bit less established, seems like, than, than the RPVI. It's to the point now where uh, with the RPVI, a lot of IR residents are, are graduated. And just because we've done the cases and capable of taking the test, it makes sense. Go ahead and do it because there are, you know, so many cardiologists and vascular surgeons out there who are doing it. Right now, it seems to be a little bit in flux. I see a lot of people with the RMSK, physiatrists, family medicine, even physical therapists. So it, it's kind of interesting. And not to go off on too much of a tangent there, but I, I think it's a great point for kind of the community to think about where do these sort of advanced certifications fit in for us as radiologists. I, I think that's a really good point that you made. Yeah. I think, you know, maybe the value could come in if you're trying to establish the practice, you know, and you need some kind of marketing point. I just, you know, if I did a, a fellowship in it, I don't need this little tag. And I, I will say they're working on making it better because, you know, there's only, it used to be that both the sonographer and the radiologist would get the same certification, take the same test. Now it's split, you know, so the APCA actually does the RMSK certification. Whereas ARDMS does the certification for the sonographers. And so that is a better point. And just right now in my career, I, I don't see how it could help me. And if you've done a fellowship, I don't see how it could help you. It could potentially help, you know, a general rad or somebody who did an IR fellowship potentially. But I think if you're an IR doc, that holds a lot of weight. You're the interventionalist. Like you don't need to prove to anyone. And so on that note, talking about pathways for training. So musculoskeletal ultrasound 
it's not universally taught in radiology residency or, or even MSK radiology fellowships. You obviously had a great experience with that. And from, from what I've understood, it seems more and more the fellowships are, are really building up this experience. But as with all things related to training, it's, it's variable from institution to institution. So for radiologists who are coming out and maybe didn't have that formal experience in their training, but obviously as radiologists have good ultrasound knowledge and, and skills, what are some good ways for them to get started acquiring the hands-on skills? You know, for, for radiologists, the biggest challenge is going to be getting out of the reading room. I think for IR docs, it's going to be a little bit easier. And, and I'll tell you why. You know, if you're a radiologist and the only procedures you're doing are fluoro, like, you know, esophagrams and things like that, or CT guided stuff in a hospital, you don't get a lot of opportunities to hold the probe. You've got to get your hand on that probe. You've got to get that probe onto a patient. I will tell you that a weekend course is good to establish a base of information and get feedback. I haven't actually done one, but I know a lot of radiologists who have, and then their biggest complaint is when they come back, they don't get to use the information. You don't get the repetitions in to do it. So my first thing that I tell people is first make this commitment that you're going to learn it or become good at it or implement it in your practice. You know, you've got kind of the skill set in your mind already. And so what I do is I use other cases to gain experience. Okay. So if you're going in there and you're going to put in a pick line. And, you know, you're used to doing your pick line. Now's a great time to look at the median nerve and kind of just look at it, you know, like you get to do it, right? That was a thought I had earlier, though, when you're talking about, you know, we, we see a lot of these structures on the ultrasound, but as we do, we sort of, we zone in, you know, we're focused on the artery or just the vessels. And so that stuff we kind of subconsciously put on blinders. It's like the T-Rex in the Jurassic Park, you know, it was like, he only sees motion, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> So you forget about everything else, but yeah, it's all there. That's why, you know, it's just, it, it's just a stepwise progression. You're in there and all you got to do is slide down that right next to the, the artery and vein. And there it is, you know, there's the median nerve. That's your first big MSK case. You just did it right. Then just slide down to the anterior elbow, turn your probe a little bit, look for the ligaments and tendons and, um, start doing that. Every case you got there, there's, there's an MSK part in your way <laughs> for everything that you're going to do to this patient. Yeah. So I was kind of thinking about this earlier when uh, I was looking at your practice's website and just the number of services offered and the conditions potentially diagnosed. It's really staggering. It makes you realize just how big of system MSK is, which, you know, is obvious. I mean, it's literally the entire body from head to toe. <laughs> and so that's kind of one of the interesting things I think about MSK ultrasound compared to say, abdominal ultrasound, there's kind of a finite number of things within the abdominal cavity and it's, it's a discrete region. Whereas MSK, you can take those skills with the ultrasound and basically put a probe anywhere on the body. And then it's just a matter of knowing from your experience with cross-sectional imaging, what's there and then just anatomy textbooks and that kind of thing. So super versatile tool. To me, that's one of the things that's a little bit daunting. Because you're an expert with assessing basically everything in the body. And perhaps like you're saying, you know, can acquire some better knowledge of say the forearm anatomy just by looking at that when, when we're doing those kind of cases. I'm just curious what you think about that aspect of it being so broad and approaching it in a way where we're offering specifics about what we're seeing rather than, you know, we talked about kind of the, the general soft tissue ultrasound that we're probably used to reading from the emergency department where we say no evidence of an abscess. How do you approach getting specific with so many different areas? Right. So first of all, just your knowledge of MSK pathology is going to help a lot. I would say the first thing is your job is to differentiate whether or not what you're seeing is in the skin, in the muscle, in the tendon, in the joint, in the bone, right? It's very basic, you know, so, so look at it like that. You know, a lot of times the sonographer will show you a quote unquote fluid collection or mass. And if they didn't include that stuff, but let's just say that they did, or you're in there and you notice, Hey, there's a, a wriggly looking worm thing inside this fluid collection. What is that? Right? So your knowledge of what a tendon looks like on ultrasound is going to kind of prompt you to think, okay. If this wriggly worm thing inside of a fluid collection in the forearm came from somewhere, where did it come from, right? 
So then you just follow that down, follow the fluid collection down to the extensor compartments on the wrist. And you know that if there's a missing tendon in one of those extensor compartments, that's the tendon of choice. And so then you can get specific. You can say, hey, this is the extensor carpi radialis tendon. And we know that just through medical knowledge, and if it's an extensor, it's on your lateral side of your arm. It's a carpi. It's going to attack to the carpus and it's the radialis. So it's on the radial side, right? So you just kind of put those things together. And, and instead of just like knee jerk being broad and being safe, you make that jump. You kind of say, hey, I know all this stuff and now I'm going to apply it to this image. And yes, that's a torn extensor carpi radialis tendon. It's retracted this many centimeters from the, just choose something, you know, like the wrist joint or the radius or whatever. And then you've now prevented the need for an MRI. So that's how you start becoming specific is you just use common sense, really. And like you were saying, it is kind of daunting. If let's just say you're looking at a cross section of the muscle in the forearm, right? It takes a minute to get oriented. I'm not saying that I'm hundred percent going to pull up a single image on a cross section and be like, yeah, that's the extensor carpi radialis muscle versus, you know, the, uh, brachial radialis, right? It's going to be hard at first, but then all you have to do is be like, okay, I don't know what muscle this is. Just slide your probe down to the extensor compartment and you're going to find it, right? You just have to know that one anatomy and that's the key to the rest of it. And then, you know, once you find that known anatomy, then you can work away from that and say, okay, this is the median nerve. This is the radial nerve. This is the posterior interosseous nerve. And then since, since we're there, now we know what are the common injuries or what are the common syndromes that occur with these things? You know how to evaluate those because it's a focused exam then. So you go from your broad exam to your focused exam, and then it helps because the patient's there. You know, I had a patient yesterday that came in with a posterior interosseous nerve syndrome. He just came in with lateral elbow pain. And I found that his uh, nerve was smashed down to about one millimeter through his radial tunnel. And the nerve next to it was about, you know, triple the size. So, wow, that's, that's the symptoms. And then I injected it and now he's better. Yeah, that's, uh, that's awesome. And so it, it sounds like basically when, when approaching these things, you're going to get a case and you have to approach each one with the, the basic knowledge and the skills that we have. And as you see those things over time. You may see, oh, this reminds me a lot of that similar case that I saw a few weeks ago. And then bam, you know, you confirm your hypothesis. Uh, but like you're saying, a lot of it is just knowing what the anatomy is and just adapting it to use this modality we're all very comfortable with, but in an area where maybe we're not used to using it so much. Right. That's right. And a tendon is a tendon, a bone is a bone, right? And techniques for interventions work on everything. You know, somebody will say, Hey, you know, I, I think I don't keep count anymore, but I'm probably close to 10,000 injections. Maybe someday wow. I'll try and figure it out. But it's like, you know, if somebody comes to me and they're like, Hey, um, can you inject the tendon of the abductor digiti minimi or, you know, at the master knot of Henry, you know, can you inject that? Yeah, I can inject that. I can inject anything. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, it's like, it's like, <laughs> if it's a tendon, I can inject it. Right. You know, I've done a couple of Master Not a Henry injections, but you know, when patients or, or doctors are like, you know, I want to find somebody who's an expert in this. Well, you are the expert. You inject tendons, you do tendon procedures, you do tenotomies, you know, you do all this stuff. And if it can be reached, it can be done. Absolutely. And then just using those, uh, the general coordination skills, doing, for example, vascular procedures with the, with the ultrasound for radiologists and specifically interventional radiologists, that's probably the easiest part of it, I imagine. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like the stories I've heard about the weekend courses and they are great courses, believe me, like, you know, John Jacobs there, you know, all, all these great guys are there. The techs are great. They do it, but you know, you go there and it's not just radiologists. And in fact, it's a minority of radiologists. So I'll tell everybody now, just on this show, if you don't get involved in this, it's not going to be ours anymore because with POCUS coming out, Everybody thinks that they're a sonographer now. Everybody thinks they're an MSK expert on sonography. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but there needs to be a, an established order of things where, hey, if somebody does a POCUS exam, that doesn't replace an actual MSK ultrasound. That's not the code for that. You know, they need to come up with new codes for it, but they are using the regular codes. But, you know, what's going to happen is they're going to see that the nurse practitioner is going to be like, oh, I put a probe on there. There's nothing wrong with this arm. Let's get an MRI for that. And now we've just lost the whole utility of that ultrasound and they build for it. And then because that was already built for it, insurance isn't going to pay for it again. And so that's, that's going to be kind of a disruption there. So if you're interested in MSK, now's the time to start.
I'm glad you brought that up because the unique position of radiology, it's a tremendous opportunity for us. But as you described, there are definitely some potential difficulties with it. You kind of described the ones you had uh, in a private practice group set up. And of course, in academic medical centers, like you said, busy as well. So the challenges certainly exist, but I agree with you. I think it's imperative for radiologists to formalize this in their practices. And because it's a matter, I think, of the, the quality of what's being offered, you know, the, the chasm of quality is quite significant between a, you know, very sophisticated and protocoled exam that's very thorough of the rotator cuff versus, you know, sort of a, a pocus that there's not really any quality guidance to that. And it may, may not even have a written protocol for what's being assessed. And it's really not even necessarily a written report. You know, they just integrate that into their objective section of their report. And they say, hey, I looked at it with the ultrasound. There's nothing wrong. We'll do something different. So I'll just give you an example that a patient that I had fell through a floor, like through the metal grate, uh, lacerated their anterior ankle. The POCUS exam was negative. It had a fluid collection. I'll say that. And they were sent for MRI. Um, it was a workplace injury. They were sent for MRI, which was negative, completely normal. Nothing wrong with this person's ankle. They can't walk. The dude is in tears. He can't go to work. So then I'm in there. I'm doing the ankle exam. The only thing that was abnormal was the anterior tibialis tendon was wavy. You know, it was completely intact, but it was kind of wavy, right? And so I go up to the level in this laceration, the way it, the way it happened, you know, he fell down. So the laceration came up at an angle. And so I found that it was completely severed above the level of the ankle right near the myotendinous junction, but because, you know, number one, the MRI didn't cover up that high. And number two, the laceration kind of cut the tendon in a lengthwise way, almost full thickness. I mean, it was basically a full thickness, but kind of flayed it in two at an oblique angle. So nobody could find where this thing was because the injury was actually way above where the laceration was because it just went underneath the skin and then up and then cut it higher. So then, you know, the doctor's like, he's like, I know there's gotta be something wrong with this tendon. You know, he's an orthopedic surgeon. He's like, there's got to be something wrong with it, but he's got an ultrasound and an MRI saying that they're normal, right? That's the level of care that you need to provide is, you know, you got to look for that stuff. And the only reason I went up higher than the laceration was because the tendon was wavy. And that, that required you knowing that you're going a little bit outside of what you typically look at on the ankle or whatever and following the abnormality. Yeah. And, and, you know, a lot of people will put, you know, a foot in, in plantar flexion techs do it, you know, they'll put them in the MRI with their foot and plantar flexion, which we don't like, but they do it. And, you know, that keeps that tendon tight. So the tendon looked completely normal on the MRI. <laughs> like I said, it's, it's a bit daunting to think about how many of these things, you know, that we can potentially diagnose that by our other modalities are practically completely invisible. But I think it, it actually speaks to the potential of the modality, which is, which is really exciting. And really enjoyed talking about all this today. And one last thing I, I'd like to ask you about is your, your company, Institute for Advanced Medical Education. I think this is really interesting. And I, I'd like to know how you got interested in CME. And obviously with the topic we're talking about today, how does this all fit in with musculoskeletal ultrasound? My grand scheme in life that I came up with really is to make musculoskeletal ultrasound as ubiquitous as MRI and as available and as quality, right? And so, you know, there's all this talk about it's operator dependent and you can't trust anybody. The way to fix that is through education. So when I started the, the ultrasound first, I started just giving educational conferences. You know, I was just giving lectures to doctors and anybody who would listen, really. You know, I just put on a little lecture at a restaurant and invite people out. And then, so I started to look for CME for that, to provide that for people when they came. Originally, I was doing it as an invited speaker to, you know, societies and things like that. And then, you know, I called the uh, Institute for Advanced Medical Education, which I had been using since like 2014 for vascular and breast and body CMEs for ultrasound. And I talked to the guy and he was like, yeah, you know what? I would really like to retire at some point. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he was like, would you have any interest in, you know, buying the company from me? And I was like, you know what? I really would have that interest. And so we just started to talk and built a relationship and I came on as co-director of the program. And then over probably a six months period of time, I, we just transitioned over to ownership to me. 
So that's how that happened. I mean, it really did. It was very serendipitous and that's pretty much my entire life. You know, <laughs> I was going to say it's a, co- it's a common thing, but as they say, fortune prepares the prepared mind. So mm-hmm. that's um, right. <laughs> and, and, you know, there's really something about putting it out there, you know, is I know that book's kind of quacky with Dale Carnegie at one point, but it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, it really is, you know, you put it out there to the world and you talk about what you're passionate about all the time. And next thing you know, opportunities are going to come your way like that. I had no intention of buying a CME company. This was in November of last year, by the way. And right when I started full-time practice in this. Now, basically, you know, I'm using that as a, you know, it was kind of a three-tiered thing, you know, in my grand scheme of things to get MSK ultrasound out there. And this was one of them that was supposed to happen, you know, five years from now. And uh, that just came onto my lap. And, you know, now I'm going to start releasing, you know, a full MSK course intro to advanced, I'll probably do maybe one to two courses a month right now. And, you know, these courses would be appropriate for sonographers and radiologists or any other doctor that that would want to learn about it. And that's just where it's going right now. Well, that's, that's really exciting. And the website is IAME.com. Yeah. Institute for Advanced Medical Education, IAME.com. The company itself has been around since like 1992. So it's it's not just some fly on the wall, you know, uh, drive in CME company. They've been there a long time. And then I also do uh, third party providerships through that, which what that is, is say you wanted your practice to give a course, you know, you'd call me and say, Hey, I want to give this course CME. We would set it up. We'd make sure that there was no commercial biases, make sure that you're following the regulations for the ACCME. Right now we do that for a major medical journal. We do it for the American Academy of Aesthetic Medicine several other websites and several other uh, doctors and groups, or say your group wanted to set up a CME program, we could do that too, you know, just for in- in-house. Fantastic. And it sounds like should be pretty soon to have musculoskeletal ultrasound offerings for some of our audience who are tuning in. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a couple things on there that were already there uh, from Tifi, who's, you know, a big name in MSK. And then Marnix Van Holsbeek um, has two books on their tendons and muscles, I believe. Um, but those are more of like, that was a partnership with him to provide the book and then give CME for you doing the books. Um, but we're going to be working on those. Uh, we should be releasing introductory courses starting on September 8th. And then, you know, I'm still kind of experimenting with it, but you know, anybody that buys a course, um, I'll probably do like a one Saturday a month or something like that, where you, we just get on a webinar call and we go over questions and, you know, cases that you have had for about, you know, 30 minutes or an hour. And just, you know, we just have a a community talk about it. Excellent. Yeah. This sounds like a really great utility. We're talking earlier about for ways of radiologists and interventional radiologists get more involved in musculoskeletal ultrasound. Sounds like it's going to be a great way to help some people dip their toe into the waters. Yeah. And again, if anybody had some specific questions or about the business model or anything like that, I'm on LinkedIn. It's easy to find me. So I would encourage anybody to contact me through there or, you know, like if they want to reach out to you, I'm happy to give them my information. Fantastic. Well, Dr. Cox, I've really enjoyed talking today about this whole topic of musculoskeletal ultrasound. Learned a whole lot. I think our, our listeners will as well. Any final closing thoughts or additional topics you'd like to discuss before we end? I would just, you know, encourage everybody to make that jump and, you know, don't be too quick to recommend that MRI. Just think about ultrasound because it, it can do a lot of things. And I just throw out a couple of resources for everybody. So the ESSR, the European Society of Skeletal Radiology, ultrasound in Europe is far superior infrastructure than it is here. And so the ESSR is kind of a big authority on it and they put out the protocols for all the joints. So I would encourage everyone to use those protocols if they're going to set up a, a protocol for their program. And then there's also a consensus statement from them from, I think, 2017, they just just updated 2020 for the indications for musculoskeletal ultrasound and indications for uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound guided interventions. So check those out. You get them for free, I believe. Um, If you just type in ESSR, MSK ultrasound on Google, you will find them. Fantastic. It sounds like a great resource. And we'll, we'll be sure to link to that as well as IAME and all the other potential resources we discussed during the show. Well, Dr. Cox, thanks again for your time. I really enjoyed our conversation. I think that our listeners will really enjoy learning about a lot of what's out there as well. All right. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. And to our listeners, we'll catch you on the next episode. 
Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team lead is Kieran Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhorter, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Ann Dang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.